Welcome all our visitors, do we have any? And uh, one thing I want to say that you probably wonder why I'm up for the next, have been there for the next three weeks. Rodney's been out of town, and uh, so uh, he will be here the next two Sundays because you're wondering why I'm up here all the time. And he'll be here, he's been out of town, and, and uh, so he'll be here the next two Sundays, and uh, I should be up here the first Sunday in November if I'm alive. We thank Brother Shaw who picks up on the Sunday evening. He did a wonderful job, and we certainly glad that he's with us as far as song is concerned. Let us have a word of prayer, and then we'll have our first song. Father, we're truly thankful for this another first day of the week. We come here to receive your engrafted word that will be preached from this pulpit. We hope we have an open mind to receive the words that will be edifying as we grow for this life and to inform those who are not Christians and to revise us as we go for this life. We ask you to be with us as we go for this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's one connection I want to make. Our last hymn, and I'll re I will repeat that again, should be 394, what a fellowship. 394, but I'll announce that when we get down to that. Our first hymn will be number 48, and after that we'll have our morning announcement. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Anywhere was Jesus, number 48. All together, say. Anywhere you choose, I can say, please go. Anywhere you need to see in this world below. two or three announcements that we want to uh, make everyone aware of. Uh, first, those who are in need of prayer, uh, this is this was sent to me uh, by Tina. Tina's uncle, Jerry Hill, uh, who is already down in Florida, they're having a family trip. As a matter of fact, I believe they're leaving this afternoon to head down there for a family trip. Uh, but he was already down there in Florida, but it was put into the hospital because of blood clots in the graft in his arm. He's on dialysis. <clears throat> he also had a mild heart attack while he was in the hospital. Uh, he is doing a little bit better, but will be in the hospital a little longer. So we certainly want to uh, pray for Jerry Hill, and we'll put this in, our, in the uh, bulletin for next week uh, with the understanding that we'll let everyone know if, if anything changes. Uh, but uh, traveling and, and being put in the hospital is never a good combination. So we want to uh, pray for Jerry uh, this morning. Uh, this was handed to me uh, by Mackenzie. This is a friend of hers who used to attend West Cobb Christian a friend of hers named Rachel Van Note. She's been having seizures, and she went for an EEG on Friday. And they were asking for prayers that, that that turns out okay. And it's kind of an interesting thing because it only happens when people when people ask her questions is when she goes into her seizures. So we're, there's probably a stress issue there that's that's manifesting itself in these seizures. So we want to uh, pray for Rachel Van Note as well. We also want to pray for a friend of ours from Macklin Road, um, Mary Roach. Um, known her since we attended since we attended Macklin. Uh, she has been put in the hospital in Northside, and she is not doing well. As a matter of fact, they called the family in, uh, and we're prayerful that for one that she can come back uh, she can come back from this. But if nothing else, that she's made comfortable and and her last uh, her last uh, time on on this earth is, is comfortable, but we're praying that her, she regain her health, if at all possible. Uh, just a, two other announcements. Uh, the dinner for this Wednesday, uh, the sign-up sheet is in the foyer, so if you're planning on coming for dinner on Wednesday before services, uh, go ahead and sign up out there on the sign-up sheet. Uh, we also uh, let you know that there are absentee ballots. Those who uh, vote absentee in the upcoming elections, the ballots are on the table out in the foyer, so make yourself, uh, avail yourself of those if you need those. I know a lot of people need those because they are not in town when the elections occur, so 
go ahead and take one of those if you need to. That is all I have. Uh, we do want to remind uh, everyone we've got, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be traveling, and we ask that, uh, we ask that you uh, pray for those who may be traveling, those who are going out of town. The Miller's going to be going out of town. Rodney and Iris are out of town. Uh, the Yorks are out of town. They've gone to Florida to, I believe, we, uh, be with her mom and dad. So there's a lot of people that are on the road, and we want to, uh, we want to pray for them. Uh, Mike, are you you're going to be here for the foreseeable future? You're going out again. Okay, so we need to pray for Mike. Uh, that he has safe, safe travel. There's so many people are driving. Bad weather, bad drivers. Please pray for everyone. Uh, Dan wanted me to announce that the block building out there has been re-keyed to fit this building. So if you have a key to this building, you can get into that building. Uh, so don't try the other one. You can get rid of that. Anything else? If you have anything else and you want to uh, get that to me before our uh, services are over, I'll make sure that we get those announcements out. Also, the cans for agape. And I say this because guess what I found when I went home? Found a can. It was tucked up underneath some stuff in a de- in a, on our desk, and I had no idea that we even had one, so I'm bringing it back with some change in it. But just if you would, take a look around and get those back to us so that agape, when agape comes, that they can, uh, they can do. Yes. They're at, yes, please, if you have them, please bring them by either tonight or this week so that because they are going to be coming this week to pick those up. So please remember to bring your cans for agape. That's all I have. Thank you very much. I'd be remiss to say if my glasses are looking right, it looks like I see uh, uh, Yolanda with us this morning. Look at that. She's, she said she'd be here at least twice a month and she kept a word. Thanks for Joanne and for bringing her her personal chauffeur. So we're glad to have her with us uh, this morning. Okay, as we continue, let's turn to number 37, Angry Words. We will sing all three verses of that hymn. <laughs> Angry Words, number 37. That's all I got to sing. Number 730, what a friend we have in Jesus. Number 730. 
We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of number 730. Whoa. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Father, that we are able to come together this morning and honor you, Father. We thank you for all the blessings you put upon us each and every day, Father, watching over our families, our friends, and our neighbors. Thank you for all the blessings you put upon us. We have shelter, food, transportation, and a source of income. Father, we thank you for that. But most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sin. Father, we'd like to ask that you pray for this congregation. Watch over us and help guide us. Be there for those who are sick and who need you, Father, if it's your will. And we pray for what we do today is pleasing to you, Father. We ask in your name, Father, that forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Place your markers at 584 will be a hymn of invitation, 584. The hymn before the sermon will be number. 694 to Canaan land I'm on my way 694 we we'll sing verses 1 2 and 5 and let us stand those who can as we sing this hymn before the morning lesson 694 2 1 2 and 5 2 Canaan land I'm on
dinner announcements, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge a, a, a milestone. Uh, Bobby and Nia celebrated their 49th wedding anniversary. 49th? That's impressive. I mean, that's, uh, especially nowadays, uh, for, they said that the average marriage fails within three years. Three years. And we've got folks here who are hitting uh, their 49th and 50th wedding anniversaries, and that's something that we can, be, we can point to with pride. And uh, we're thankful for that, that the, the institution of the family and the home is not dead within the Lord's church. It is still very much alive. 60. <laughs> that's, uh, that's getting even, that's getting even, <laughs> that's, that's in the rarefied airs. I will say this, when I was at Freed Artiman, I attended the congregation right there in town at, in, in Henderson. And they asked one time, the, the minister there, uh, um, Ben Flat, asked uh, for the, those folks. He would call out the, the year and, and people would stand up. Folks who had been married for 10 years and people stood, a lot of people stood up 10 years. And he asked for 20. <clears throat> and then the people who had 10 sat back down, the people who had 20. And then slowly but surely, slowly but surely, he got up to 50. And of course, you know, you had maybe six or seven large congregation, but about six or seven people stood up, six or seven couples stood up. And then he asked for 70. And one couple stood up, and they were a much older, very elderly couple. They'd been married for 70 years. And it was just one of those things where he said, I just want you to stand there for a second. He said, you know, this is, it, now things happen that this just, it, it's not able to happen. One, one or the other spouse passes, he said, but, but for that to occur, for the couple, both partners to still be alive and to be married for 70 something years is just impressive. And it wasn't 70, they had actually been married for like 74 years. And the, the idea of, of making, of, of intentionally making that last for 74 years is impressive. And it's something to be striven for, I believe. I believe God, that's what God wants. What about the rapture? <clears throat> now, I'm thankful. <laughs> The, the, uh, with the re-release of the movie Left Behind, this is, a, this is an older movie. Uh, Kirk Cameron, who was a child star from back in the 80s, uh, did a movie not too long ago called Left Behind. And it was a take on the book that was written by Tim LaHaye and another fellow back in the, uh, uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s. They did this, this Left Behind series. And it was taking the idea of uh, premillennialism and the dispensation and the, uh, uh, and the rapture. And they wrote this book, this series of books, and the idea that uh, uh, the premise of the movie, of the first book in the movie, is that um, there is a rapture, the rapture that we read about in in popular uh, in popular fiction, that these people are taken away, and this this pilot is as flying his plane, and he looks back, and there there's nothing left of half of his half of the people that were on the plane. The clothes are in the seat, but they they have been completely taken away. And uh, I, I never understood this. If, if, everything is, if everything is physical, why their clothes weren't taken, I'm not real sure about that, but they couldn't, under, they couldn't make that very clear to me. But they've re-released this with Nicolas Cage, and I'm proud to say that the movie tanked at the box office. I'm happy for that. I'm happy for that. I believe that hopefully this means that people are rejecting this theory, the idea of a physical rapture. The rapture that we read about is being rejected by people. Maybe it's the fact that Nicolas Cage is not a very good actor. And they just didn't want to go see him in a movie. I don't know. Maybe that's it as well. But the idea of this movie being re-released and it not doing very well at the box office bodes well for people finally rejecting this idea of the rapture. But I don't think that's the case. So many of the denominational ministers, especially those who are of the Pentecostal movement, believe idea the idea of a rapture and, and that there will be... Uh, improve themselves, that they can repent, that they can come back to where they need to be and then Christ will come back. And some people believe that He will come back and stay for another three and a half to seven years. There will be a, a great battle and then He will establish a millennial kingdom on this planet for a period of time and then everybody will be taken away and then there will be the judgment. That's basically what rapture boils down to. And you may have seen cars with these bumper stickers that says in case of the rapture this car will be unmanned. I, I don't like the idea of that at all. The, the driving in Atlanta is bad enough with unmanned cars barreling down 75 at 60 miles an hour. I, I don't think that's what the Lord has in mind when it comes to bringing people and taking people home. 
But the doctrine of the rapture is espoused by a large segment of the denominational world. And you've heard uh, denominational preachers speak as if it's something to be found in Scripture rather than just a theory that they may have. They, they speak as if it is found in Scripture. And let me be, I want to make sure that you understand completely the idea of the rapture that people speak about, that people teach, that people preach is not found in Scripture. And I'm probably talking to a lot of people who know that. But the key is this. A lot of times we know something that is true or not true, but we have a hard time explaining it. We have a hard time defending our belief against those. And that's part of studying the Scriptures is that we can make a defense for our faith. We have to be able to confront people in their area, and we need to be able to confound them with the Scriptures. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, the idea or the doctrine of a secret rapture, the idea of a secret taking away, Jesus coming and taking a portion of the population, a portion of the believers, is part of a very serious defection from Scripture. They're taking Scripture, they're twisting it to say something that it most certainly does not mean. It's known as dispensationalism or millennialism, and it is a deceptive set of doctrines that many, and I'm sad to say, some in the church have been pulled away by. There are some in the church who believe in the rapture, the idea that there is a group of people who will be pulled away secretly one night or one day, and it will happen and nothing will be left of them, and the rest of us will be left behind, hence the name for the books. But that's not the case. So what is meant by the rapture? In a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, a man named Hal Lindsey, who is still alive and is still uh, uh, pushing this doctrine, he lives in Texas now, he makes this definitive statement. This is definitive. In uh, page 126 of this book, The Late Great Planet Earth, he says, someday, a day that only God knows, we get that right. When Christ comes back, this is a day that only God knows. in contrast to this great event. It will be the living end, the ultimate trip. Well, part of that he has correct. Jesus is coming back. He doesn't know when, only the Father knows when. He is coming back. He will take us away. He is going to take us away. And he is going to take us to a place that is absolutely the most incredible place we've ever been. All the, th all the great things, I, I think about the wondrous things that I've seen on this planet. I think about the wondrous things I've experienced on this planet. And if you took all of those and you lumped them into one sum total, every bit of it, the, the culmination of all the great things here on earth are nothing in comparison to heaven. Which should tell us what? That we should be able to give up and willing to give up anything here on earth in order to achieve a heavenly end. I think that's something that we can all agree upon. So he's got that correct. The problem is the other things that go along with what he espouses in his beliefs. Now Mr. Lindsay is an authority among dispensationalists and millennials and premillennialists. He's, he's an authority, and they go to him when they need help understanding what he has espoused for these many years. He tells us that the word rapture means to snatch away or take out. The dictionary uses words such as ecstasy to describe it. So the idea of ecstasy is that idea of being pulled away or taken away or snatched out of the current situation that we find ourselves in. We're no longer in that situation. We are in something greater. This taking out of the world is supposed to be in direct relation to a series of events that will culminate with the return of Christ with those taken away in the rapture. So understand this. It means he's going to come. He's going to take these people away. He's going to take them to an incredible place, a place that transcends anything they've ever known on earth. But when the time comes, he'll bring them back to earth. And they will fight in a war that has never seen the like here on earth. They will fight against Satan and his angels. Now, they will win. The end has already been promised. Now, that's another thing that we have correct. That's another thing that he has correct. The war for Christians has already been won. The war has already been won. We need not fear the end of this war. The war with Satan and his angels has already been won. It was won at the cross. It was won at the cross. 
We no longer need to fear anything this world has to offer us or this world has to threaten us with because the war for our souls has already been won. All we have to do is fight the battles. We have to fight the battles. But the end result is already done. So he's got that correct. So he's going to take these people that he's already pulled out of and taken them to this great place, and he's going to bring them back here so that he can fight Satan and his minions. Then at that end of that battle, he will set up his thousand-year reign, the idea of the millennial, this thousand-year reign here on this planet. The earth will be transformed to an earthly paradise, and for a thousand years, Jesus will reign on his throne. Most people believe that it will be in Jerusalem. He will sit on this throne for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, we will be taken back away to heaven. The faithful the, and those who repent and, and make themselves right while this earthly kingdom is going on. Now I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to say this. By logic, this is unnecessary to give people an opportunity after this to repent. Why? Well, let's look at Jesus in Luke chapter 16. We're not going to turn to there, but I'm just going to bring this to your remembrance. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he gives them the example of the rich man and Lazarus. Now think about this for a second. He says, there was a poor man named Lazarus and there was a rich man. And while the rich man died sumptuously, Lazarus died from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And at the course of time, both of these men died. Lazarus was taken to Abraham's bosom. The rich man was in torment. And the rich man, being in torment, looks up and cries out, Father Abraham, please send Lazarus so that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. He says, there's a great gulf fixed. He can't go there and you can't come here. Then, then, then allow me to go back and, 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 and warn my brothers because they're going to end up in the same place that I'm in. He said, they have the law and they have the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, but if somebody goes back from the dead, they'll listen. He said, if they won't listen to the law and the prophets, nothing is going to change their mind. So that tells us this. It wouldn't matter if Jesus took the group away and then came back. There are those in this world who will not repent no matter what happens. No matter what happens. They will still look at it, they will scoff, they will reject, and Christ will come to naught even if he came back with people from the dead. So logically, there is no reason for Jesus to come back to this planet and allow people more time to repent. They've had the time to repent. They have everything they need to understand where their souls are. And if they won't listen to this, they're not going to listen even if Jesus came back. Why? It's a fraud. It's a fake. There was no, there was no rapture. They, these people were hidden for a period of time and then he brought them back. No. They came back from the dead. Well, I don't care. I'm not going to do anything. There's nothing in this for me. I'm rejecting it. There are people who are going to reject no matter what. So the idea of the logic of having a secret rapture and then bringing these people back so that others can repent makes no difference. For some, it will not matter what happens. So the idea that Jesus will launch this thousand-year reign in Jerusalem, and all of this is, is a speculative and it's speculative fantasy, and it, it makes for great reading, and it makes for great television, it great, makes for great movies, but it has no basis in Scripture, much like the, the movie Noah that came out. It had no basis, anything I saw, had no basis of anything in Scripture. It was just some man's idea about what might make a good movie. Well, that's exactly what the idea of the rapture is. Some people have tried to set this time date, and I always found this interesting, people who feel that they can predict the end of the world They've set dates when this rapture is supposed to occur. And in the truth of the matter is there's never going to be one, but we have to understand that we cannot set God's clock. God has set a time, and it says that God has set a time in the future, so he knows when it's going to be. And it makes no difference what we feel. It makes no difference what we say. It makes no difference how we, how we discern it. God has set a time in the future for this to occur, and there's nothing we can do about it anyway except remain prepared. Get prepared and stay prepared. Find our faith, find our salvation, and maintain our salvation. It makes no difference when the final judgment is going to be. If you're a Christian and you're living as a Christian, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's tomorrow. It doesn't matter if it's 20 minutes from now. It doesn't matter if we get through this worship service this morning. God has set a time, and there's nothing we can do about it. The best thing for us to do is get prepared and stay prepared. 
And how many people do you know are not prepared for that judgment? I can't, I, I can't list everybody I know that is. I know for a fact they're not prepared for this judgment. So it makes no difference when this supposed rapture was going to occur. For one thing, there's not going to be one. For another, we can't predict what God is going to do. God is going to do what God wants to do. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, it states, Truly I say to you that this generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. Now that's the statement from which uh, Mr. Lindsay takes his, his, his idea that there's going to be a rapture. But the idea here is this generation will not pass away. Obviously, this is his words, not mine. Obviously, in context, the generation that he's speaking of would see the signs, chief among them being the rebirth of Israel. A generation of the Bible is something like 40 years. Remember, these are his words, not mine. If this is the correct deduction, that within 40 years or so of 1948, the date he assigned as the birth of the modern-day Israel, that's what he's taking, modern-day Israel within 40 years, all of these things to take place. Well, what date would that make that? 1988. What happened in 1988? Well, a lot of things happened in 1988. People were elected. People died. People were married. People were given in marriage. Children were born. Nations arose. Nations fell. People walked around the earth doing their things. But guess what? There was no rapture. Why? Because there is no rapture. Those things will not take place. That's what happened in 1988. It's more, more likely to say what didn't happen. There was no rapture. One simple answer to it all is that the signs of Matthew chapter 24 happened a long time ago. Happened a long time ago when Jerusalem was destroyed by the crushing power of the Roman Empire. That's what he's talking about here. When this generation, he was speaking of a generation over 2,000 years ago that would not die until they saw the things that were going to happen, happen. Those things that were supposed to occur, they occurred 2,000 years ago. They are certainly not going to occur anytime soon. Can we still derive instruction from the scripture that were written, was written in? Absolutely we can. For one, we have to be prepared. That's what he's telling us. That's what, God, that's what Jesus is telling us. These people are going to be caught unprepared. We can be caught prepared. There are certain things that they, there's, they, were, they were completely out of the power of the person that was listening to these words. Those things were going to occur on a level that was far above anything that they could have any power to stop or, or cause to happen. He's saying, you just, I'm letting you know. He's telling us the same thing. There's something that's going to happen in the future, and you need to be prepared for it. One, you could pass away. You could die. You could leave this earth. You could die, and your soul be, be returned to, to, to its maker. We have to be prepared for that. Another is that God could send his son for the second coming, for that judgment day. And we have to be prepared for that either way. But it certainly is not the idea that Mr. Lindsay is espousing in his book. The error of this rapture theory is, is, is fairly obvious. Think about this for a moment. Think about this for a moment. The Lord allegedly returns secretly. He takes all of the saints away, specific saints, not everybody. There are people who will be believers but will be left behind. Now, it doesn't go into what constitutes someone who's going to be taken and someone who's going to be left behind. But he's going to take a certain group of believers away for a short period of either three and a half to seven years, depending on which theory of the rapture you subscribe to. He's going to come back and engage in the most awful carnal warfare that this world has ever seen. Then he's going to go to Jerusalem and set up a millennial earthly kingdom. I like what this guy says. This man said, he heard all of this and he quipped. He said... If I ever get headed off this planet in the right direction, I certainly don't intend to return to it and fight a war. That makes perfect sense. If I'm going to be pulled away to this perfect place, I certainly don't want to come back here and fight an awful, bloody, carnal warfare. Well, that's not what God's promising us. Jesus certainly didn't say, I'm going to take you away and then bring you back. Once we're gone from here, remember, there's a gulf fixed. There's a gulf fixed. We're not coming back. Once we're there, we're there. Wherever our future is set, wherever our eternity is set, there we will be until for eternity. There will be no more time. There will be no more earthly time. The doctrine of this imaginary rapture doesn't fit plain Bible teaching. It doesn't fit it relative to the next appearance of Christ. Consider this. Where will the Lord take the believers? Where is he going to take them to? Uh, during this set three and a half or seven year period, he can't take them somewhere in space or to another planet. 
He can't take them to anywhere on earth in a secret hideaway because Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, that the universe will be totally destroyed. In first, uh, 2 Peter 3, 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief. And that's accurate. That, in that case, it is going to be secret. It's not going to be something proclaimed to the world. He's going to be coming as a thief in the night. He's going to come and nobody's going to know that it's happening. But he will come as a thief. There's not going to be any place left for Jesus to take the saints. There's no other place. There's either heaven or there's hell. There's no place to take these saints for a three and a half or seven year period of time and then bring them back. Everything that we understand, everything that we know is going to be completely destroyed. This statement shows that when the Lord returns, it will be anything but silent and secret. It will be noisy and open. But the fact is there really is no place left on earth or in space where the raptured can go. There's really only one place left, and that is heaven itself. And the word the rapture is used for their doctrine is the verb caught up. And that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 7. And we find this in Scripture. What does it say? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. left shall together with them be caught up. And the Greek word is there, there is harpzado. Harp, harp uh, that's, you know, I don't speak Greek that often. Harpazo. Harpazo. We will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Now, if you didn't have a, a theory to defend, if you weren't someone who was just desperately trying to defend this theory of the rapture, be a temporary, anything but a temporary rapture. It'd be a, a, a part-time thing. It'd be something for a short period of time, and then it would lead into something else later on. You would never conclude that the place was anything other than heaven itself. There is no other place. So the rapture doct doctrine fails the very first test that the Bible has for it. One, there's no place for the rapture to go. When the Lord comes back, everything will be completely destroyed. Well, that, that, that's, that's the second time, no. When he comes down to take the, the raptured, they're going to go back to another place, and then he's going to come back. Well, then, the, then he's going to set up a kingdom. Well, how could he with everything gone? There is no earthly left. There's only void. That which the universe once was it goes back to. There is no place for them to go. This uh, fictitious doctrine called the rapture uh, is alleged to follow what's called the Great Tribulation. And just about the time when this tribulation begins, the countdown has also begun. And here's Mr. Lindsay again, how Lindsay says, Most prophecies which have not yet been fulfilled concern events from which will develop shortly, at, uh, shortly before the beginning of and during this seven-year countdown. The general time of this seven-year period couldn't begin until the Jewish people reestablished their nation in their ancient homeland of Palestine. Now, Here's where, this all, here's where this falls apart. Go to Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. This is speculation. God has made no promise to Israel that has not been fulfilled. There are those who say, oh, no, 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 no. He still is. Say, in Joshua 21, verse 43, So the Lord... Plain scripture. So the Lord gave to Israel all of the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers. How can you, how, you can't misconstrue that. You can't misread that. God gave to Israel all of the land that he said he would give to them. You have to intentionally misread that. And they took possession of it. And in verse 45 concludes, not a word, now here it is, the promise has not been fulfilled. Well, scripture tells us otherwise. How can you misread that? Well, they, they still haven't had all their homeland. Yes, they did. They had all of their homeland. And he said, as long as you serve me, I will be with you. But when you don't serve me, I'm going to divide this up and I'm going to give it to the other kingdoms. And that's what he did. 
He's not talking about something in the future where the, the nation of Israel comes back and, and, and sets up their homeland again. He's talking about when he promised them, when they left that land of Egypt and they headed towards the promised land, he said, I will give it to you. He gave it to them. He said, as long as you serve me and worship me, I will continue to be with you and I will preserve you. They failed to worship and serve him. Therefore, he took away their kingdom. He took away their lands and he gave it to other people. Matthew chapter 24, verse 20 and 22, the theory of the rapture also claims that there will be an increased amount of wickedness. This is the idea of the tribulation. There will be Time from the beginning of history to today, we could say, well, you see, these are the end times. This is the great tribulation. God, you know, Jesus is getting ready to come back to take his people. Folks, things have always been bad. And it seems like things have always been bad in that particular portion of the world. And I don't know why it is we feel that it's because things are bad in the Middle East that, that it, it represents the end of times. It's always, you know, things are happening there. Therefore, here comes this tribulation. Folks, there's always been increasing wickedness. The days of Noah, every man did what he wanted to do. Every thought of man was evil, continually. In chapter 24, verses 20 through 22 in Matthew, And pray ye that your flight not be in the winter, neither on a Sabbath, for then shall be great tribulation. See, there's tribulation even then. Such, hath, such as hath not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days had been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. This passage, no matter what these people might think, right? The passage refers to the destruction of Jerusalem, and thus they were to pray that they did not have to flee Jerusalem during the winter time or during any of any during on the Sabbath when the travel would have been would have been prohibited or restricted. That's all he's talking about. Something very fleshly, something that was going to happen. It was something that was going to happen during that generation. People were going to see this happen. And guess what? You look through history, that's exactly what happened. There were people who saw the destruction of Jerusalem. They had to flee for their lives. It has nothing to do with any sort of tribulation leading to a rapture of God's people. And finally, Jesus taught his disciples in parables. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, he teaches them about the kingdom by using the example of a farmer. He says that while a farmer slept, an enemy, meaning Satan, sowed weeds in his wheat field. This is when the harvest is going to occur. It's at the end of the world when there is, there is no time left. This is when the great reaping and the great harvest is going to take place. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. This means that the wicked are going to be gathered up first, but then immediately after that, the saved in Christ. And then those who are alive in Christ will be taken. But will all be taken at the same time. There will not be a, a seven-year period or a thousand-year period or any other period of time. We are all going to die we're all going to be resurrected and we're all going to meet judgment at the same time, folks. This idea of the secret taking away is nowhere to be found in Scripture. And only by intentionally misreading the Bible can we come up with a conclusion that some have come up with. That's the only thing. So when your friends, when you hear people talk about it, I can't wait for the rapture, I can't wait, you know, this is the, the, I see the signs, this is the beginning of the end, these are the end times. Folks, we've been in the end times for over 2,000 years now. We're in the end times. This is it. We're on the final stretch towards our final goal. The question is, are we going to remain faithful? Are we going to remain prepared to meet the end that all people are going to meet? Death before Christ comes, or to be alive when Christ comes? Even the Schofield Bible, and this is a man who, who for, in most cases, believed 
scripturally, even the Schofield Bible leans towards the idea of a rapture. But the question is, which are we going to accept as fact? Are we going to accept Christ or Hal Lindsey? Are we going to accept Christ or Schofield? I think as Christians, we accept Christ. Christ is our ultimate authority. He tells us all things. He's revealed all things, and all things are revealed to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We can understand what the Bible says. The doctrine of the rapture is a ruse. It's a falsehood. It's not a reality. It promises things that God never mentioned, for one. It offers a false hope, the idea that we have time after the end times to repent and to come back, but we read where that's not the case. We read that's not the case. We, we, we'll never get an opportunity after we die. It denies plain Bible teaching, and it's contradictory to the New Testament teaching on the end of time. And if it were true, and this is the most important thing, if it were true, it means that Jesus Christ is a liar. And not only a liar, a delusional liar. Well, I can tell you this, my Savior is not a liar. No falsehood is found in his mouth. No guile was found in his mouth. He said what God told him to say. He was completely obedient in all things. And when he promises, when he comes back, we will all be taken to judgment. We can, we can set our watches by it. We can absolutely 100% believe that we will all die and we will all go to the judgment. His kingdom is not an earthly kingdom anyway. His kingdom is the church. The church is what is going to deliver the gospel into the world. So the question is this. When he does come back, all will be taken and all will be judged. Are you ready to be judged? That's a question you have to ask yourself. Are you ready to be judged? You have to ask that question for yourself and you have to answer it for yourself. If you aren't, we invite you, please do what you need to do in order to be judged by Jesus Christ. If you need prayers, if you need to put on Christ in baptism, please come while we stand and while we sing. Chuck for a wonderful sermon on the rapture. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let us turn to uh, 645, the old rugged cross. 645. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 645. On a
At this time, we are about to partake of the communion to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We find in Acts 20, verse 7, the early church where the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break, to partake of the bread. Jesus, before he was crucified on the cross, he instituted the Lord's Supper. He used two elements, that being the bread, which represents his body, and the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. Whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, we should examine ourselves to make sure that we are doing it according to the scripture and that we examine ourselves to partake of it in a worthy manner. Let us give thanks for the bread. Father God, we come to you at this time thanking you for all the blessings that you give us each day and thanking you for the bread which represents thy broken body. This we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
Again, Father, we come to you thanking you for all the blessings that you give us each day and thanking you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross in our behalf. Father, we thank you for the fruit of the vines which represents the blood. We pray, Father, that as we partake of uh, this element that we will examine ourselves and show that we are worthy to partake of this. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Let us give thanks for the offering. Father God, we come to you again to thank you for being so good to us. Thank you, Father, for letting us be able to take care of our families and provide the necessities of life. We pray, Father, that as we partake, uh, lift this offering, that we would do so in a worthy manner and that we will be able to uh, give the funds that we need to uh, keep the church going, to pay for the uh, different things that we need here at the church. We pray, Father, that you will watch over us and protect us at, at this time. This we pray, and that's in Jesus' name. Amen. Four, we'll sing verses one and two of Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. As we sing this song, let us stand, and after that, we'll have our closing prayer. 394, verses one and two. What a fell.
Let us bow our head. Dear Lord, we like to thank you for this wonderful day that we was able to come worship in your name. We like to ask you to watch over the people who are struggling and those who are sick all over the world. We like to ask this in your name. We also like to ask you to watch over Central as we leave this place and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen.